Okay, I will share my screen. Okay, can you guys, can you see my PowerPoint? I can. Yes. Perfect, okay. Uh, so today I am going to be talking about results from about half of my dissertation. Um, so I'm in year four, starting to finally get some interesting things to look at. Um, and so I'll talk about um, the response of ephemeral wetlands in the Great Plains um, to changing climate conditions. Specifically today, um, I'll talk about precipitation and temperature. And I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Missouri, Columbia, and I'm co-advised by Lisa Webb and Keith Goyne. So I recognize that everybody on this phone call probably knows where the Great Plains are, um, but I just wanted to take a quick second to highlight some of the differences um, between the Great Plains in Missouri and also uh, talk a little bit more about why we're working in the Great Plains and not Missouri on this project. Um, so like Missouri, uh, the Great Plains and the area where the playas exist are historically grasslands and prairies. There are uh, certainly differences in composition of the species in these regions because uh, the Great Plains are a little bit drier of a climate than Missouri historically. And so we would have had short grass prairies here. And similar to what's happened in Missouri, this has led to a lot of cultivated land. Um, so as you can see down in the bottom right, uh, this is a pretty common sight when you're flying over the Great Plains, you have these round uh, circles on the landscape from pivot irrigation, a lot of that water is being pulled out of the Ogallala Aquifer, which is in decline, and so water shortages are becoming really persistent across this region. Um, in areas where the aquifer may be lower or where uh, the soil isn't as fertile, there is a lot of pasture in this region as well, so a lot of cattle um, ranching is a really big part of their agricultural uh, culture. Historically in this region, climate extremes have been fairly normal, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And that's something um, that's come up a lot when we've talked with farmers in the region is that they're used to having these extended droughts, um, flash thunderstorms, and a lot of variability between years and um, within a year as well. And another thing that's really important to me when I um, have been approaching this project is that over 90% of the land in this area is privately owned, um, which means that when we're when we're working on conservation efforts, we have to keep private landowners as a, a priority stakeholder. So again, if you've been on this project for the last four years with me, you've heard about playa wetlands. Um, playas are persistent and ubiquitous throughout the Great Plains, um, ranging from Nebraska down into Texas. Uh, specifically, I worked in two regions, um, the Rainwater Basin, which is highlighted in green here in Nebraska, and the uh, Southern Great Plains region in Texas, highlighted in red. Um, so playas look like this. This is an area view of playas. Um, they are depressional wetlands on the landscape and have a few unique features that um, allow them to provide a lot of ecosystem services in the Great Plains. And one of the reasons why we decided to study playas instead of looking at wetlands in Missouri um, in looking at climate change impacts is because they're hydrologically isolated and they're completely driven by precipitation. So each one of these depressional wetlands sits in its own watershed. Um, they are not connected to the groundwater. The, the aquifer sits about 300 feet below the playas. And so they may be recharging water into the aquifers. And, and in fact, they are recharging a lot of water into the aquifers, um, but uh, they are only receiving their water inputs from precipitation um, or runoff coming from the surrounding watershed. And then again, um, when we think about management priorities or conservation priorities in the future, the fact that most of these exist on private land is also something that's really important. I um, mean, in potentially a little bit of a contrast to the wetlands that we have in Missouri. Um, in Missouri, a lot more of our wetlands are uh, publicly owned and along floodplains. So um, you can imagine that studying the impacts of precipitation change on a floodplain wetland in Missouri is going to be a little bit more complex than a, a wetland in the Great Plains that's only receiving inputs from precipitation. So playas are one of those wetlands where most of the year when you look at a playa, you're gonna say, wow, that does not look like a great wetland because it looks dry. 
but that's actually a really important part of the playa life cycle um, and how it resets itself each year. Um, so most of the year actually, playas are dry as you'd see in this picture. Um, oftentimes in the spring, they'll receive rainfall um, that doesn't necessarily cause inundation, but does allow for moist soil vegetation to start to grow. Um, so this would mean that it was flooded probably for two or three days, and then as that water recedes, um, you get this nice stand of annual forbs and grasses that have really great seed production for migrating waterfowl. And then it also, you can see this mud flat area, that's a really good habitat structure for a shorebird. Um, at a couple different points in the year, playas might become inundated completely, as you can see in this picture. This is really important for waterfowl habitat because waterfowl need open water, but not too much open water. Um, so playas that have been um, either modified by humans act as a lagoon for maybe a cattle operation or for a city water treatment facility. Um, so, so when humans are starting to add excess water into the playas or um, concentrate areas, they become these permanent water structures which is not typical of what a playa typically would have existed as on the landscape. And so that's when you start to get vegetation such as cattails, bulrush, you start to get this emergent um, vegetation and algae. Um, but typically a playa wouldn't really go through this stage in a life cycle. But as you can see here on this picture, all these may exist in a year. Um, for a playa, especially those first three pictures. And so they have a lot of seasonal variability in what they look like um, to a bird flying over or the services that they're providing to the, the surrounding landscape. So not only is there seasonal variability, but playas are really dense on the landscape. And so we also get spatial variability and the organisms and the landscape have co-evolved with this, with this variability in the playas. And so if we have a playa um, about once every square mile on the Great Plains, we may have one that's wet, one that's dry, but um, because there's so many of them, they still are able to support the ecosystem services. And therefore, they end up working in a complex. And so it's really important when we study these wetlands, even though each exists in their own independent watershed, they are not influencing one another, to the ecosystem services they're providing, they're acting as a landscape scale um, complex. And so losing just one of these wetlands um, is potentially a problem uh, for the services that they provide. And a lot of work is being done on how playas are going to be changing on a landscape scale. Um, so especially looking at inundation frequency across the landscape, how many of these are going to be um, flooded in the future, how far are there, how far is the distance going to be between the flooded playas. Um, but what we don't know a lot about is how each individual wetland basin is going to respond to threats. And so that's what I'm looking at studying for my dissertation. Just a little background on the climate in the Great Plains. Again, this is the climate team. You guys probably know more about this than I do. Um, but in general, we have this trend in temperature. Um, so from north to south, um, we have temperature increasing in the Great Plains. And then in, for precipitation, historically, there's been an east-west gradient where we have the highest precipitation on the Gulf Coast down there in Texas, and then um, precipitation decreases as we move west. Um, under RCP 4.5 scenario, um, there's expected to be an increase of about 2.6 to 2.8 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Um, I will, for this presentation, keep everything in RCP 4.5 because that's the model we used for, or the scenario we used for my research. Um, just a quick note. And then uh, for predicted end of century annual precipitation, um, we do see that there's a difference now that's starting to persist between Texas and Nebraska or the northern and southern extent of the Playa region, but um, that change is not not a whole lot. Um, so a precipitation change of between negative 0.6 to positive 1.7 millimeters per month. So we're taking that information, um, the ecosystem processes that the playas provide, as well as these um, temperature and precipitation trends, 
Um, and for my project, we tried to come up with the most accurate way to predict the future temperature and precipitation trends and use those predictions in an experimental setting so that we could evaluate the impacts of these changes on the soil ecosystem, the plants that are growing in that ecosystem, and then hopefully make some inferences about what that means for greater ecosystem services, such as providing habitat for migrating waterfowl. And of course, all of this is in a scope of anthropogenic influence. So not just um, the anthropogenic climate change that's happening, but also how are humans using this land? Are they going to respond to some of the changes that may be um, occurring in the future? And so we also, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the at the end of this presentation about how we tried to get at some of those interactions as well. So I won't go into too much detail about my climate treatments. I gave a webinar about these a couple years back, I think. Um, we've currently got a paper in review at Ecosphere trying to, to publish the methods that we used. Essentially, um, what we tried to do was select climate scenario data, um, so model output data from the, the global climate models and downscale that to a usable format for our ecosystems. And so we, again, selected RCP 4.5 data. Um, there were 19 models that fit our criteria um, from that list. And we used point data located at um, Lubbock, Texas and Hastings, Nebraska in the middle of the two regions where we worked. Uh, we downscaled the future or we used, sorry, we used downscaled data, but we bias corrected the future data um, based on historic weather data in the region. And um, then further, we selected models that we could apply these treatments in a greenhouse and growth chamber setting. So for predicted temperature change, so we had 19 models here, which you can see in the top left graph. Um, this is the predicted temperature change relative to the historic range we looked at from 1985 to two, or 1986 to 2015. Um, so highlighted in red here are the three models that we selected. So our goal was to capture the variability that existed within a scenario. So you see here, um, model 10 was one that had low temperature change prediction. So it was not predicting that temperature would increase a whole lot. Um, and this is during the month of germination. Um, and then we chose one model, model 11 there, that was sort of an average temperature change in this scenario. And then one that had the highest average temperature change prediction in this scenario, model 15. And so again, um, for the Southern playas, we used the month of March because that's when germination is typically onset in Southern playas. Um, and for Northern playas in Nebraska, we used the month of April. For predicted precipitation change, we wanted to look at um, primarily the growing season, so between March and October or between April and October um, for the northern and southern playas. But here um, on the right side of the screen, these are all 19 of the models that fit our criteria modeled just so you can see the variability across the year. Um, so the top is predicted precipitation change. Um, the bottom is the predicted change in dry days. So here on the northern playas in Nebraska, we can see that there's a lot of seasonal variation with what the what the models predict is going to happen with temperature or with with precipitation. Um, whereas with Texas here on the right, they in general predict a decrease in precipitation throughout the year. And this could be why in that original um, graphic I showed from USGS that. Nebraska is predicting to have a precipitation increase um, and Texas has one, a precipitation decrease, but you can see there's a lot of seasonal variation. And we wanted to make sure that we captured that seasonal variation. And so we selected three models that would be representative of future scenarios. One that was on average um, more precipitation over the growing season, a moderate amount of precipitation over the growing season, and then one that had the highest decrease in precipitation over the growing season and use those for a greenhouse study. So we had a six month greenhouse study. The soil was collected from the playas and then we brought it back, grew the plants in the native seed bank. And then we followed it up at the end of the six months. We took soil samples, put them in these incubation vials and um, measured greenhouse gas emissions from that soil. 
I'm not going to go into too many details about my methods. If you do have questions about my experimental design or how we set up this experiment, I'm happy to answer those at the end. So for the results, um, I'm going to present results in three different categories. Um, so the first thing that we measured over the six month growing season in the greenhouse was the soil ecology. So we looked at soil carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus, um, the biogeochemical cycles. We um, looked at the soil microbial populations to see if we could try to track some of these um, biogeochemical cycles in the soil and see if they were different amongst these different precipitation treatments. Next, I'll talk about plant ecology. Specifically for this, I'm going to talk about my germination study rather than the plant ecology from the greenhouse study. Um, but we will talk about how uh, temperature and precipitation impacted germination, so early season growth in the plants. And then finally, I'll share um, some of the results we're getting from the greenhouse gas emissions incubation study. So we ran all of our models um, as mixed effects linear regression models, where we were trying to see if there were main effects of our different precipitation treatments. For soil ecology, so for the uh, organic carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, we had no differences between our precipitation treatments. So what I'm showing here is um, some of the other drivers of those, um, of those parameters in the soil. So for instance, um, both total organic carbon and total nitrogen had a negative correlation with bulk density in the soil. Um, and this makes sense. So this is all of the months averaged together um, because there were no differences between the months or between um, the different precipitation treatments. But this is what we would expect to see. Organic carbon is typically going to be um, more present in, or it's going to be present in higher abundance in soils with lower bulk densities. We also see the opposite impact in um, phosphorus. So phosphorus is a particulate nutrient. So it's typically more associated with particles. And so when we have higher bulk densities, um, it makes sense that we saw higher um, phosphorus concentrations. And then going to the bottom row, um, this is the relationships between these nutrients and soil moisture. Um, and this is also what we would expect to see. Um, so total organic carbon and total nitrogen, um, they increase with soil moisture. So typically, if we have higher soil moistures, down there, um, the 0.75, 75%, that's a pretty wet soil. And so we would expect that when soils are wetter, they are probably more in an anaerobic state. So there's less oxygen present for carbon and nitrogen to be broken down or decomposed um, out of that soil. And then the phosphorus relationship here, I'm showing it. Um, it's a slight negative correlation with soil moisture, um, but that's actually a really low um, R squared and, and the p-value is not significant. So I'm showing it here, but it's probably not a relationship we really need to, to dwell on. Another thing we measured was the PLFA in our soil. So PLFA is a way to measure the soil microbial communities. It measures the phospholipid fatty acids in the cell membranes of different taxa and is able to, using those markers, identify bacteria that are gram-positive, gram-negative, um, it can look at the anaerobic bacteria and some uh, of the fungal populations. And so it's really a coarse measurement of, of the taxa that are present in the soil microbes. Um, and what these graphs show, um, these are sort of like a principal component analysis. Um, they're showing relatedness or likeness of the different dots there in the, considering all those different taxa that I just mentioned. And so on the left, I'm separating them out by treatment, but that's our seven um, precipitation treatments. As you can see, if these were really different from one another, we would expect them to cluster separately. So there's those circles surrounding the dots would not overlap with one another. Um, but really, we see that most of them overlap. Um, there's maybe some differences that are starting, but there's a lot of variability between the different samples within a treatment. So they're, so they're not clustered separately. And I showed on the, the right just something that I think is also interesting. Um, so we have here, it's clustered by the site where we collected the soil. Um, I think a lot of what, what, a lot of the reasons why we don't see a lot of difference in our treatments from this greenhouse experiment is that 
even within a playa or between playas, there was a lot of variability with the soil characteristics. And so this one actually clusters a little bit better in some cases than the when separating them out by treatment, but it separates in a different way. And so there may be some variability within the the soil where we collected the playas that may be driving some of the reasons why we don't see significant interactions of our treatments. So we'll go ahead and move to plant response. Um, so this is results from the germination study. Uh, so in the germination study, again, we had a future or we had an, a historic uh, temperature regime and then three future temperature regimes. So um, the three were future cool, average and warm. So cool was the closest to historic temperature, warm was the furthest from historic temperature, um, but all increased from historic temperatures in both Nebraska and Texas. So here, um, the, the model parameter that we're modeling is the germination proportion. So the percent of plants that were germinating um, at the beginning of the germination period. And, oh, someone's drawing on here. <laughs> Okay, so then what we, what we have here is for the Nebraska soil moisture and Texas. So this is the interaction or the interacting effect of climate scenario and the soil moisture and then climate scenario and seed bank density. So what's important that we see is that even within a moisture treatment, we're starting to separate out um, the response of germination based on temperature. And so this is indicative of the fact that we may have competition for resources, um, we may have um, some other uh, physiological responses happening within our plants that are causing them to, um, to respond differently to these temperatures in future scenarios. Granted, they're not um, huge differences in most cases, um, but they do show evidence that we might be having some impacts of temperature and precipitation. Um, so then the last couple results slides that are, I'll share are about the incubation study. So for the incubation study year one, um, we measured carbon dioxide emissions and methane emissions in two different incubation studies. So the first was an aerobic in incubation study. So that was held at about 60% water-filled pore space. Um, that's an ideal moisture for soil microbial activity. Um, but it also allows for um, oxygen in the, in the soil for microbes to process the carbon. And so here um, for the aerobic study, we did not have any differences in our carbon dioxide emissions that were coming out of the soil. And the same was for our anaerobic study. So our anaerobic study um, was a little bit longer. It took place over 16 weeks and we measured uh, carbon dioxide and methane again from that soil. And this one was held at 90% water filled pore space. And so that's a, a moisture that would typically inhibit some of the aerobic processes from taking place. But again, um, on both of these, you can see uh, all of the precipitation treatments really followed the same trend line. There were no differences between them at any of the different days of the study. When we get into methane, um, we did start to see a little bit different response. Um, so carbon dioxide, we would expect um, to represent soil microbial respiration. Um, methane, however, is going to represent a certain portion of the microbes, this, only a certain population of microbes, um, because methane can only be produced by um, organisms that are able to use methane in their metabolic processes, are able to use yeah, able to, able to um, emit methane as part of their meta metabolic processes. So here, um, I apologize for, for having two different states, but on the left is the Texas incubation study for the aerobic, or te Texas results for the aerobic incubation study. Um, so here we see that after day 24, we start to have differences where our our field capacity control is starting to have higher emissions than some of the others. Um, and we also have differences down here where our dry treatments, these lighter colored lines are less than the wetter treatments. And this is exactly what we would expect to happen. 
Um, so we would expect that the ones that had higher moisture during the growing season may have promoted a higher microbial population to emit methane. And so this, I think, I think shows nicely um, what we would expect to see. And then again, um, on the right, we have Texas in the anaerobic incubation study. Um, the Texas incubation study for the anaerobic conditions was a little wonky, um, so that's why I chose to show Nebraska. But we have here a little bit different response. Um, we can see this controlled dry treatment. Um, the light blue line is still increasing at the end of 16 weeks for methane production. And so it's, we're not really sure why we would have seen this much um, methane production in a soil that was held dry over the growing season. Um, so these are some interactions that we can still explore further um, to see if we can look at um, maybe the substrate availability in the soil or um, other trends over the growing season that may account for these differences. So in summary, um, from the ecological components of my, my research so far, um, we didn't see a lot of main effects of the treatments, but we were able to identify some of the drivers um, like bulk density and soil moisture that are impacting soil and plant responses to changing climate conditions. Some of my, um, some of the reasons why I think that we're not seeing these main effects um, is first because this was a short-term experiment and so even though um, we're not seeing large effects, so it, it may be because over a longer period of time, we would start to see them um, become more severe. So we only subjected these treatments for six months and um, for only four weeks in the germination study. And so that might be limiting our results. We also, um, like I mentioned earlier, attempted to mimic field conditions, um, but this introduced a lot of random variation between our samples. So instead of having true replicates, um, we were trying to gain inference and, and mimic field conditions by looking at this variability within the wetlands or between the wetlands, um, but that probably caused us to not be able to tease out some of the really um, detailed processes that were taking place. And um, because this was more of a course study to look at a lot of um, the general trends, there are probably more complex biogeochemical cycles that are taking place and being affected by this, but we didn't measure every detail of the carbon cycle or the nitrogen cycle. Um, and so that might be the next step in this is to look in more detail and see if there's other processes that are being impacted. But I do think based on the results that we're getting, um, there's a chance that climate change is going to have an added threat to the playas in some capacity, um, whether that be um, altering the germination at the beginning of the season, um, potentially causing carbon to be emitted at a higher rate via carbon dioxide or methane um, when water inundation patterns change in the wetlands. Um, we're starting to see some evidence of that by, based on this research, um, but we definitely need more research going forward to, to better articulate and quantify what these changes might be. So what, as I was doing this, um, it really led me to the question of, okay, so we're doing all this work in the greenhouse. Um, people are, are working on how this might be impacting the playas at a landscape scale, but what are some of the other barriers that we have, even if we're able to quantify and address some of these threats, um, are they going to be able to be addressed in the field? Um, because these are privately owned playas, because we may have communication barriers or um, other barriers to addressing climate change. And so last year I received the Science to Action Fellowship from USGS and we were able to start to look at some of these questions. So again, 90% um, of playas are privately owned. So uh, even if we can identify that climate change might be impacting them, we have to have a way to get that to the people who are managing playas. Government regulations fall short of conserving playas, um, and so they are not protected either by the Clean Water Act or by um, the Food Security Act of 1986. Um, they are non-jurisdictional wetlands, so we cannot, um, a farmer can cultivate them as long as they don't have to modify the drainage in order to cultivate them. Um, and so this is pretty common practice, um, that they are either cultivated or planted um, or used 
in a manner that's not sustainable for the playas. And now um, from our ecological study, we know that climate change is likely going to add an additional stress at the individual basin scale and also at the landscape scale. So for the funding that I received from the Science to Action Fellowship, I was able to attend field days um, to both educate on some of the findings of my research and plies in general, um, but also conduct a survey about farmer and stakeholder perceptions to climate change in the playa region. From there, um, we're working on developing outreach materials. And then we're also looking to tie together some of the ecological and sociological data to identify some of the benefits, consequences, risks, trade-offs for landowners um, in addressing climate change moving forward in the playa region. Um, and also try to tie in some of the other threats that are facing the playas. So here's a map. Um, I was really busy last spring um, traveling around the Great Plains going to these meetings. Uh, so some of these meetings were field days um, in Texas. The field days were actually field days. We went to the field. Um, I helped to coordinate those workshops, but there were also others that I went to um, like the Rainwater Basin Joint Venture Informational Seminar. Um, that one was one where I was just able to set up a booth um, and talk to people who were attending this event. So it was a really wide range of the types of events that I attended. And then I talked to a wide variety of people, everybody from farmers and landowners all the way up through researchers who are studying um, in this area. Um, there were policymakers at some of them, um, certainly agency representatives and managers. And it was a really great experience for me to get out there too. Um, and spend time in the playas and learn from the people who are there year round. So anecdotally, um, we did not have any qualitative sections of our survey, um, but we did, I did pull some quotes from the events that I went to. And I just wanna mention a few quotes that stuck out to me as the reason why people can serve playas in the Great Plains. So in Western Kansas at the field day, one of the farmers said he's happy to give the landlord the enrollment money because I don't want to pay rent on it. So most of the time farmers are losing money on playas um, because they are going to flood out at certain times of the year or they're really poor soil. Um, they're really heavy clays and so they're not necessarily going to grow great crops. Um, granted that varies by the, the region that you're in. In Nebraska they may be more fertile. Um, in Texas and Kansas they are not as fertile um, for corn and soybeans. And so farmers are losing money. So if they could get money um, through conservation programs, they would gladly take that money and not pay the rent on it to their landlords. Um, another farmer said, Western Kansas, and we've got sandhill cranes. That's pretty neat. Um, and he was talking about uh, when the playas fill up, they have migratory birds stop at them. And that was something that he had always gone to see with his grandparents living in that region. And he wanted his grandkids to be able to see that as well. And so people are driven by wanting to have wildlife on their property, which was such a cool thing for me to hear because um, sometimes I don't feel like that many people care about birds. Um, and so it was neat to hear this, this mindset that people care about conservation for the wildlife. And then one of the really big things that came out of, of these meetings for me um, was the water scarcity issue in the Great Plains. And so one of the Clovis um, New Mexico City Commissioners during a talk she gave in New Mexico, um, she said it's not just about the data, we need bold ideals, ideas coupled with bold commitments. Um, and this is in reference to a project that they're working on near Clovis to try to shut off wells um, that are pumping for irrigation and really take advantage of the playas on the landscape to help um, get water back into their city water system. So here is a picture, um, National Geographic did a story on the town of Clovis. Um, on the south side of town right now, they have to bring in water and give their kids baths in five gallon buckets because they don't have um, ample running water in, that, in some neighborhoods anymore. So the quantitative data that we collected, um, we did do a perception survey. This is really similar um, to the questions that Abigail asked on her survey. So if you heard her presentation in Kansas City, um, I use essentially the same questions just customized to the Great Plains. Um, we also asked the questions um, here. You can see it says, um, how concerned are you about the following threats to agricultural production? 
So we had both agricultural production and we also had playa wetlands. Um, and so we asked the same questions for both playas and agriculture. I solicited responses to this survey at the field days um, and we also sent out press releases and shared it in newsletters after the field days were over. Um, so people were able to fill this out either on paper or electronically, depending on how they found the or how they heard about the survey. I haven't gotten into this too much yet, um, but some of the things that I wanted to look for with this survey, um, as Abigail mentioned, uh, climate change beliefs may influence farmers' views of risk perception or stakeholders' views of risk perception. And we saw that. So here is um, on the bottom, they were asked the question on the Likert scale, climate change is not occurring. Um, and so therefore, if they said strongly agree, that means that they don't believe that climate change is happening. And then on the y-axis here is a concern about dry periods. And so here people who strongly disagreed that climate change was not occurring. So in other words, they believed that climate change was happening and were very certain of that. Um, they had a higher perception of concern about dry periods than people who did not think that climate change was happening. And for me, it was interesting because this was the same when we, when we were considering threats to both agricultural ecosystems and playa ecosystems. And I think that this shows that playas are just really ingrained in the, in the ecosystem there and people, people do care about them if they, if they get the chance to do so. Another thing that was useful for us um, and, and what we're using in developing some educational materials, we also asked the people who took the survey how they primarily get their information about climate change. So here, um, TV and internet are two of the highest, but people also said workshops and seminars. Um, so I think that that's A, either evidence of bias because people found out about this at workshops and seminars, um, or it shows that hopefully by making materials that people can use at workshops and seminars. So I can't travel to all of these workshops um, and playa scientists may not be able to be there, but if we can give some of these NGOs and agencies who are working with farmers um, materials that they can share at workshops and seminars in the region, um, then I think that that's a good way to get some of this information to landowners and the people managing playas. So my big takeaway from both the work that I've been doing for my dissertation as well as this fellowship project um, is that if we can understand the biophysical response or the ecological response of playas to climate change and also understand um, the human perceptions of the risk in the climate, um, we can work on identifying research and management priorities moving forward. And so some of the suggested priorities that I think my, are some of the, the priorities that I think my research suggests and points to um, is that uh, we should be focusing on soil management um, when it comes to bulk density or soil moisture. Um, a lot of these playas, especially in the northern playas, have the ability to control when water is put on their playas, or we can work on um, improving the hydro hydrology of the playas by adding buffer strips or um, removing some of the pits that drain playas. So getting the playas back to a, a more natural bulk density, soil moisture, may help to mitigate some of the impacts of climate change. Um, there may also be potential for competition of resources in the plant community that could be explored further. And then uh, looking at the biomolecular mechanisms for controlling gas emissions, I think is also a priority area based on what my research is finding. And lastly, um, I think that education and outreach about the benefits of playas in the face of water scarcity is a particularly interesting way to spread the word about playa conservation. People are concerned about water scarcity um, and concerned about keeping water on the landscape in the Great Plains um, so that it will be able to sustain livelihoods moving forward. And so talking to people about how playas help in um, keeping water in the Great Plains and recharging the aquifer, I think will be an important outreach strategy moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and throw this um, slide up here with all of the people who've helped um, with this project and also helped with the field days and the um, fellowship project that I did. And I would love to take any questions that you have about this work.
Hey, Rachel. Yes. This is Pat. Hi, Pat. Hi. So I have a question for you. Um, and this goes back uh, pretty close to the beginning. Um, when you were talking about the life cycles that playas go through, um, I guess this is less about the, 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 the chemistry of the things that you've shown. And I just, I'm curious about something, that slide. So when things get to the way they are in the lower right-hand corner, you're saying that that is uncommon in the Great Plains playa. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so in and, and looking at the picture and, and, and hearing what you'd said earlier, so when, so it's possible that this can happen? Yes. But unlikely. So typically, you'll only get playas that have this um, more permanent inundation if they're putting water into them, some, if, they, if it has some additional water input that it would not have had historically. Um, okay. So this, so this could be like water coming off of a city stormwater district, or um, the playa being used as a lagoon for a cattle operation, something like that. That's usually one of the only times that you'll see playas fill this full for this long of a period of time, or for so a long period of time. This would not be common in the Nebraska to Western Texas corridor. Correct. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Rachel. Sure. Thank you. And uh, I guess, uh, as Emily indicated, this will be uh, posted uh, later today. And um, unless anybody else has any other comments or anything, um, we'll wrap things up. And uh, November, oh shoot, I have my calendar up here just a second ago. November 8th, yeah, will be our next one of these. And um, I guess with that, I'll say thanks again and everybody have a good day. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.